I would like to introduce uh, Naomi Lemitig and uh, Larry Band, who will be talk telling us about their work on modeling ecological systems. Yeah, Great. Well, you got it. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, uh, and as Greg says, we're going to talk a little bit about the eco-hydro modeling um, that myself and Larry do. So um, I'm Naomi Tegg. Um, I'm a professor at UC Santa Barbara. I'm going to speak first and then uh, oop, turn it over to Larry, um, who's at the University of Virginia. So the model that um, both Larry and I have been principal developers, originators, architects of for really um, probably 20 years now for a long time is Rhesus. Um, and Rhesus is a model of coupled carbon, right? Uh, growth, allocation of that carbon to plant growth for grasses and trees and soil biogeochemistry combined with a pretty sophisticated hydrology model and a model of radiation forcing. There's a lot of details with respect to this model. Each of these processes, something like snowmelt is a submodel within itself. And these kind of have evolved through time to become increasingly sophisticated. Uh, so probably the best way to familiarize you with the model is to give you some examples of how we use it. I will say a couple, I'll bring a couple of things to your attention right now. The model is spatially distributed. So that means we basically break the landscape up into different modeling units. Um, but we don't just model those units separately. We also move stuff around on the landscape. That stuff is typically water, but also nutrients and as well as fire. So we break the landscape up spatially and we account for relationships between those spatial units on the landscape. And it's a model that moves through time, usually at an hourly to daily time step. Um, it's a complex model. It's tens of thousands of lines of code. Um, and we maintain this on, on GitHub. And as I said, it really is constantly evolving. So to give you a sense of what this model does, I'm going to go through make some examples of how we've used Rhesus to look at um, climate, drought, fire, and forests and water, right, in Mediterranean type ecosystems. And, and those are ecosystems where most of the water inputs fall during the winter. And so there's a substantial dry season during the summer. And these are often topographically complex. So you have snow at high elevations. And those of you, many of you are in California, and California is a classic Mediterranean type ecosystem. And many of the examples I'm going to go through really reflect California, but we do do this work actually in Mediterranean systems uh, throughout the world. And in these systems, there are a lot of environmental challenges related to both the fact that the climate is changing. You can see here a graph of increasing temperature for a small watershed in the California Sierras. And at the same time, these areas often have increasing populations that are expanding into what we call the wildland urban interface. People are moving into the natural areas in those systems. And increasing population also increases the demand for water. So these are problems that we argue you really have to look at from a coupled perspective. So in these systems, any change to the vegetation, whether it's its amount of vegetation, its structure, its composition, affects the water cycle. But the water cycle in turn affects how productive that vegetation is. Both of those things together affect disturbances, things we really worry about like fire. And then those of course in turn affect things like water. And these all occur within a context of climate and radiation forcing that really vary across the landscape with things like aspect and elevations, as well as things you might not have spent as much time thinking about, but what's happening beneath the surface? What kind of rock do you have? What kind of soil do you have? How much water can it store? And we really argue that you can't really understand what's happening in the system unless you put all of these things together. And essentially that's what Rhesus does. So our goal is to use this coupled model of water, vegetation, and fire, and climate to really help with understanding how these systems work and support planning and adaptation. 
What makes Rhesus a little bit different from some of the larger global scale models out there? Um, the land surface models that you would have in a global climate model is that we really can work at these smaller watershed scales where a lot of these planning decisions, how, how much, how you manage a particular reservoir, how you manage a particular forest or a particular urban ecosystem really happens at these smaller scales. And that's the scales that we really try to address. So the question about that particular scale, that's pretty sure. close to climate models. Have you coupled um, them? We, we have done some loose coupling. We certainly use climate model output to drive rhesus. And we have done some limited um, coupling of rhesus to kind of mesoscale climate models where we take our estimates of evapotranspiration, for example, and feed that into a climate model. Um, but, you know, you'll see a little bit as I talk a little bit more, we're really being able to model at things sometimes at like 10 meter scales, which you simply can't do in a global climate model. Right. Um, yeah, but good question. So, you know, over the years, one of the things we've spent a lot of time doing in Rhesus is make sure that we get the right answers for the right reasons by comparing model estimates with observations. Those observations range from comparing against streamflow records to comparing our model estimates of carbon and water with flux towers that measure those things, um, comparing our estimates of growth with tree ring data, comparing our model outputs with remote sensing. So we spent a lot of time really trying to adjust, refine the model based on observations, as well as based on collaborations with field scientists. We, all of us in the Rhesus community collaborate closely with field scientists who are doing experiments. And then we take the results of those experiments and really try to embed them in the model. So we really see Rhesus as kind of an evolving library of field-based understanding. This is a shot from uh, work that I'm doing with collaborators in Israel who are doing a thinning experiment to see how thinning affects forests. And we're using what we learned from this experiment to improve our model. Can I ask a okay. question? <laughs> sure. Um, could you yeah. go back a slide to the um, calibration? One more. Yeah, this one. So is this an automated process? Like, do you have um, discrepancy metrics between the observed data and the predicted data that you try to optimize? Or is it more like a qualitative, um, you manually adjust the parameters until the fit is good? Both. Um, we have, we definitely have workflows that do a lot of, you know, if you're trying to optimize parameters to get stream flow signatures, we have automated workflows in, in Python and in R that do that kind of calibration. But other times, you know, we're also sometimes working in places where you have very spotty data, um, tree rings or a few individual measurements. And in those places, we may not be calibrating, we may be just looking to see is the model capturing the kind of dynamics that we're seeing in the field. So I, I would say we do both, right? Sometimes we do very automated calibration and then sometimes we do fuzzier um, kind of step-by-step -step comparison between the model and the observation. So both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, okay, so give you an example of, um, you know, looking at climate warming impacts on summer water supply. So this is a graph of Reese's output of percent based in snow cover um, through a given water year. The gray um, stars show um, results for different years. The blue shows kind of the average over the last four, four decades. And then the red shows what that snow cover would look like if things had been three degrees warming. And you see, not surprisingly, you get less snow and that snow melts earlier. A big question then is how does that translate into changes in late summer stream flow, right? In many Mediterranean systems, how much water you have say in August is really in the stream in August is really the big issue. And what we've been able to show with Rhesus is that relationship um, I'm showing on the x-axis here between how much snow you have and how much August water you have of course, it makes sense. The more snow you have, the more August stream flow you have. That's not a big surprise. But what is interesting is that the slopes of these lines are very different for watersheds um, in different parts of the Western US, largely because of their subsurface 
geology, how they transmit water in the subsurface, right? So we've used RESIS to truly, really try to explain why the sensitivity of summer stream flow to changing snowmelt looks different in different watersheds. Now, and what kind of a, a what kind of a hydrology model do you have? Like what granularity you focus on? Um, so our hydrology model, um, I would say it's a moderate complex model. We're modeling uh, kind of a su shallow sub unsaturated zone, a deeper saturated zone. As I mentioned, it's spatially distributed. So we move water laterally on the landscape, right? In the subsurface and on the surface and kind of a deeper groundwater model. And then we have a pretty sophisticated above ground hydrology model. We separately model evaporation from litter, from understory, from overstory. We model transpiration and evaporation separately. So it's a pretty um, you know, sophisticated hydrology model. And what kind of data do you have to get about the subsurface and the surface? Um, so when, depending on the particular application, the, the project that we're working on, um, you know, worst case scenario, we have globally available or nationally available data sets like Sergo. And in which case we have to do a lot of calibration or if we don't have data for calibration, we do a lot of uncertainty analysis, right? Um, we've been working with geophysicists recently where we're actually getting measurements using ground penetrating radar and we can kind of assimilate that to give us more information. So we kind of use a combination of readily available data sets and learning from observations. Okay, makes sense, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's a real challenge. And, and just to say, I, we would argue that, that that and getting good precipitation data are probably two of the biggest uh, sources of uncertainty in this type of modeling. So then we also care about vegetation. So um, those of you that live in California know that we had a huge mortality event due to drought um, a couple of years ago where you had 40 million trees that died. And we see evidence of this happening throughout the globe, but particularly in these Mediterranean type ecosystems. And so we've worked with ecologists to make sure we can try to model or capture some of these dynamics. Um, we worked on a project in Santa Fe where there was the big mortality event, but the mortality event was very um, spatially distributed where we got lots of mortality at low elevations and very little at high elevations. So we wanted to see, could we capture that with rhesus? And then can we use rhesus to try to explain why? Was it differences in precipitation? Was it differences in temperature? What led to that spatial gradation in mortality? Um, and we were able to capture that. This shows non-structural carbohydrate, which we're using here as an indicator of mortality. When it's low, trees die in the model. And you can see the red line here shows the low elevations that died at, during this drought and the high elevations that were refugia. So here we're using research to try to understand why do we get that spatial pattern on the landscape? Um, so then, you know, mortality, water, fire. Um, when's it happening? How often? What can we do about it? This is another question that we're really working on addressing. So Rhesus has a, a fire model. Here's a little animation of our fire spread model. Lots of fun. Uh, our model does not really model fire behavior. It's not a model that you would give to a firefighter during a fire, but it's a model that gives you a sense of the prob burn probability over time and how that is affected by things like climate change and land management. Here's some examples of our estimates of um, burn probability for the water supply catchment for Santa Fe. And you can see that we get the timing right. We've compared this with um, evidence of fire regime timing from tree ring data. And, you know, fires happen in the summer. That's not so surprising. But you can see that both the high elevations and the low elevations have um, less fire. And this really reflects what fire ecologists would call the fire triangle, right? Where you often have this gradient by being limited by climate, right? Which is happening at the high elevations, right? It's not dry and warm enough to have these big severe fires or at the lower elevations, you just don't have enough fuel, right? So we're really looking at this kind of trade-off between fuel limited 
and fuel flammability. And I think one of the advantages of this is that we can work at scales where we can tease that out. Um, so we do things like most modelers is we play games, right? We look at scenarios. We take an existing historic climate record and we run our, our fire, fire and our ecosystem model, and then we warm it up or we add droughts to it. Um, so just to give you a sense of what that looks like, these are area burned, 10 year averaged area burned, um, using a baseline climate, but then warming it up and adding droughts to it. When we initially start the model, because we assume suppression, we get a lot of fires, right? So we're accurately representing the fact that if you don't have fires and fuel builds up, once you let fires happen, you get really large area burns. What's interesting here um, is that once we kind of get to this more stable where we've had we've had fires happening, the um, these pink ones show drought plus four degrees of warming, and this shows just with drought. Right? And so you might wonder, well, you would think that if things got warmer, you should get even more fires. And it's true, we do get more fires if we go from baseline to additional droughts, but warming doesn't really give us more fires in the model. And the reason for that is that you start to become limited by the vegetation growth. Things get hotter, vegetation is not as productive. Our latter fuels in this red line here where things get really warm, they don't grow back as quickly. So I think what's interesting about this model is we're able to really get those trade-offs between climate kind of increasing the fire weather but because we're growing vegetation over time and we're tracking what happens to it, we also see how the fuels evolve as well. Of course, the real question is what can we do about this, right? If we spend millions of dollars, which we're doing in, certainly in California on fuel treatments, what happens? And, and we really think about this saying, well, you can thin a forest, whether this happens through fire or this happens because of a disturbance event or because you went in there and thinned the forest, you have to account for that vegetation is going to grow back. How long is that going to take? You may have species change. You may change the disturbance regimes. So how does all this play out over time is something we're really interested in. And one of the reasons Rhesus is good at that is that within each of these spatial units that we model, we don't model them as a completely lumped unit. We break it up into gap open areas and different kind of, if you will, aspatial forests within that, which really allow us to resolve what's happening when you're thinning. It allows us, for example, to increase the soil evaporation in this gap area, right? Or to allow our understory, I didn't show an understory here, but we have an understory that can grow back, which really is those latter fuels. So we have some resolution at quite fine scales that really help us be able to get at what's happening when you thin. Wait, and so then, question, yeah. how do you know these ecological responses? Like, I guess the, how much of the end of the story is or is not growing back? If this one species is replaced by another species, do you force that or do you have a model for that? So our model regrows the vegetation. We have a carbon cycling model that models both the overstory and the understory, and, and it responds to climate and soil water availability and radiation. So the regrowth of the vegetation is something we explicitly model. Change Do we have in data sets for that? I mean, you're um, validating such things? Yeah, we had some. You know, they're limited, and we're that's kind of an area of research. It's an area where... Um, We've been trying to work with, um, so for example, uh, at a watershed, Station Creek in California, we recently flew a couple of LIDAR flights because to get at that, you need really high resolution data. So what we're hoping to do with that LIDAR data is to start to at least get some evidence of what those regrowth, uh, understory regrowth or ladder fuel recovery looks like and compare it with the model. Um, you know, we have some confidence that the model grows vegetation reasonably well, because if you remember way back at the beginning of my talk, I showed some comparison with tree ring data. And we do a pretty good job of showing how growth, you know, goes down when you get a dry year, increases with radiation. So we have some kind of, you know, you build evidence kind of as a story, you get pieces of evidence from different places. And so we're constantly doing that. I think working with the LIDAR data will be the next step with that in terms of validation. 
Nice. Cool. Um, another thing we're doing, I'll point out here that understanding whether like neighboring trees get the water when you thin is it something really hard to validate, but we've been working with some people in Israel who are actually putting dye here to see, does it show up in the other tree? I mean, you know, we can do things like that, which is fun, but incredibly time consuming. So, you know, once you have a model, you can start to say, well, if I'm going to thin the forest, how much is the year that I happen to thin going to matter? So this shows precip deviation for, um, again, a California site for an example where you might have thinned, you can imagine, well, let's play thinning games where we thin in every possible year. We allow the vegetation to recover. We compare whether the soil is deep or shallow. We vary how much biomass we take out when we thin. We vary what we assume about kind of fine scale interactions between um, neighboring trees. And then we're able to say, well, how much do these things affect the response to thinning? So if we look at change in evapotranspiration, because it looks very different in the recovery over time after you thin, the um, gray line here is baseline. So for deep, moderate, and shallow soils, you can see the recovery trajectories look very different. You can also see these fine scale um, differences between do trees share water makes a big difference. And the box plots show the effect of climate. So we're able to kind of start saying, you know, if you care about stand carbon or net primary productivity, which is a good indicator of forest health or fire risk or how much water a forest is using and you start to thin, you know, how much, even in a particular location, how much does things like the weather you happen to get or how deep the soils are or on you on a north or south facing aspect or what elevation in the watershed are you? How much does that affect the results? Now, can, I ask a, can I ask a question sure. again? Um, yeah. I'm curious how, like, how fast your simulator is and how sensitive it is to the parameters. Like, to get results like this, you know, presumably there are, there are some parts of the model you don't know that you want to do a sensitivity analysis, and there's many knobs you can tweak, as you just said. Are you is it like minutes in response for every combination of trials, or how many Monte Carlo trials and how slow are they? Sure. So that's a great question. Um, and, you know, I've just did a huge sensitivity analysis where we were varying a bunch of ecophysiology parameters, right? And so how long it takes to run depends on, of course, depends on how big your watershed is, how finely you're breaking, how many patches you're breaking it up into. Because so obviously it scales with that. You know, a single patch will run in, in milliseconds, right? But a huge watershed with... 500,000 patches might take hours to run, which of course, and you know, we've done things like, um, you know, parallelize the code as best we can. But first, so we try to do, you know, kind of patch scale sensitivity analysis for some of the parameters and then scale that up to the watershed. So we have all kinds of strategies for trying to do as much sensitivity analysis as we can. Having said that though, computational limits um, you know, we just bought got time on uh, NCAR supercomputer center so we can do lots and lots of replicates. Um, so does the model fit on a sink? Do you need supercomputers or can it can is it sort of in, like sensitivity analysis is often embarrassingly parallel, right? So if the model fit on a standard machine, it's easy yes. to scale. But if the model is too big for one machine, it's harder, right? No, we can I can run it on my laptop at a patch ah. scale. Okay. Right, easily. I do run it. I, I do some sensitivity on my analysis on my laptop, but once you want for a single patch, right, like a single piece of the watershed, I do that all the time. But if we want to run a whole watershed and have the water like move laterally and run that at a really fine spatial resolution, that might take hours to run. And so then we want to run, you know, we want to take have lots of nodes to be able to run many different parameters. Um, yeah. So it's a, you know, it's a real scalable problem and how you do that is a whole science in and of itself, right? And how you do the sensitivity analysis, right? Like do you use Sobel or do you use something else? We, we spend a ridiculous amount of time trying to solve those problems and I'm not sure we solve them particularly well, but we try. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, if okay. you have any, which is my way of saying, hey, if you have any suggestions, we'll take them. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the other problem is even if you can find the computing power to run all this, you're generating hundreds of thousands of pieces of output. Sorting through that is non-trivial in and of itself. So we actually you know, start to look at machine learning on the rhesus output, right? Here's an example where we're using random forests 
to kind of synthesize what we're getting from this experiment where we did thinning over really different amounts of thinning, different soil depths, different climates. It, it becomes a lot of information to output to deal with. So, you know, we ran this through um, a random forest to say, okay, what are the most important variables and how do you rank them? So we can get a sense of if you're going to do a field treatment in this area, what are the most important things to, to consider or to worry about, right? So we've been using machine learning for um, output processing. The other area, but I'm just going to end with this and then transfer it to, to Larry, um, that is a real challenge, right? Like we learn a lot from running this model. The challenge is communicating that because our answer is always it depends, right? It depends on the weather you get. It depends on what's happening in the subsurface. It depends on, um, you know, ignition. It depends on what species you have, your topography. How do we communicate this complexity? You know, and we try to tell good stories. Um, but often that's not enough. And, and, you know, especially when you're talking to, um, you know, I, the policymakers or when you're talking to the general public, uh, you don't want their eyes to glaze over by showing them um, things like this. So we, we do fun things where we work with local artists. This is an artist um, that we work a lot with who, who's been trying to help us communicate the fact that when you thin, whether the flow goes up or down depends on how deep the soils are. But kind of more interestingly, we've built recently a, um, an animation of the model output that basically takes your landscape and allows you to look, focus in on different cubes. And um, each of those cubes um, here I'm gonna, uh, represents things like evaporation and what's happening in the subsurface. And then we kind of let that go, sorry for the noise, um, as, as an animation that people can um, change the time scale, they can warm the climate. You can see our fire representation is terrible. Um, we've just started to do this. This And this is essentially taking Reese's output and, and working, putting it into a Unity game engine. Um, we think there's a lot of potential there, but um, it was hard to do this. And, and, you know, having, using remote sensing to improve the realism of, you know, what our landscape looks like, finding ways to make this faster, because once you're trying to put all of this data volume into a Unity engine, there's, there's all kinds of data issues. But I can tell you that people were really engaged by this. And it really, I think, has a lot of potential for helping them understand the complexity that we're, un that we're using the model to understand. Okay, so with that, I'll turn it over to Larry to talk about another Rhesus application that we, we both find really interesting. Larry, I think I've turned it over to you. Okay, that's probably a little bit better. Maybe you could hear me. Can you see my PowerPoint now? Yes, but not the shared screen. Not the presentation mode. Not the shared, not the presentation. So you may have shared the so, wrong desktop, I think it's how it thinks of it. Yeah, so let me go back to presenting and how I select the uh, specific screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, now on Google Share, how do I select that particular, or did I need to bring this in as a Google Doc? Hmm. You know, that, that should be fine. I mean, if it doesn't, if you only see one option, you don't have to do the presentation mode. You can just do regular mode because unless you have an, uh, animations, then it'll be about the same. Sorry, say again. So oh, um, if you just share your regular screen, if it doesn't give you option for you know the um, presentation mode screen, you can just uh, present from a regular PowerPoint. Right. So I should be able to give you my, the my entire screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that should be good enough. And that's what you were just doing. Yeah. So 
you're seeing my entire screen, then here is my PowerPoint. You see yeah, you, you just maximize that. It should be fine. Yeah, okay. There we go. Great. Okay. So Naomi was talking to you about... But do you mind, uh, uh, Larry, do you mind maximizing it? Because right now it's small on, uh, on our screens. Uh, it's maximized on my screen. Because we see everything around Let's it. Because we don't see... Um... Are you presenting right now, or are you are you in editor view? I'm I'm going back into presentation mode, so it's filling my. Screen. Ah, so I think that's the issue. We're not seeing the presentation mode uh, view. So if you go back to outside of presentation mode, just maximize the edit window. This will oh, be good enough. Okay, let me just maximize this. There we go. Maybe that will be. Uh... Let me just do it the old-fashioned way. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so if you could see that, then we can uh, begin. I've not seen any uh, change yet. Sorry? I've not seen any change. I still see your uh, PowerPoint edit view, but about the same size. It kind of fills up the middle of the screen, not the whole screen. Yeah, so let me see if I could bring it up like That's, this. Is that improving I'm things? I've not seen any changes, which I'm not sure what the deal is then. Oh. Okay, well, that's unfortunate. I think I do okay. have the size of Google Doc as well. That shouldn't make a difference. Uh, somehow, your whatever you're doing on your main desktop is not. Uh, I don't know if others can see changing, but uh, I can't. Hmm. Now let's see. This is unfortunate. Uh, can you move your PowerPoint uh, window see, around? So Maybe it's just an update issue. Maybe it is from your side. It's fine. Yeah. So I'm just. Let me get around. Tell me when it seems to show up here. Okay, so we're, I'm, not, I'm not seeing any updates. So Great. maybe what, what you could, if you just in the current, we could see if he just goes to present mode in just in the current tab, it should be fine, right? Oh, but this is PowerPoint, so there's no that tab. Present, so I'm in now, so it's filling mm -hmm. my entire screen. And I should be sure. Larry, maybe go fine. out and go back in. Yeah. Okay, let reshare. me reshare. So I'm going to stop presenting, and I will click on present now and present your entire screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, allow me Google. Or, to... you know what? No, don't present the entire screen. Present PowerPoint application. Uh, oh, you know what? That's... I can de we can have this feed better. So if you just drag the PowerPoint to the middle, it should be fine. Looks good. Uh, yes. Keep... Now good. Now it's good. Okay, so I won't go into presentation mode. I'll Perfect. just go through here in that case. All right, so Naomi was talking about unsettled forested areas. I'm going to be talking about the city. And um, the area that I'll largely present about is Baltimore. Here is the Baltimore Harbor and the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, in Baltimore, uh, uh, some of the big drivers for our models, which are developed in forested areas, as Naomi mentioned, but we're translating that to work into dense urban to suburban areas. Nitrogen export into the Chesapeake Bay is a major driver, uh, just as it is into the San Francisco Bay out where Google headquarters is. Uh, Baltimore, which is a fairly poor city, has been in consent decree with the, Ches with the EPA to spend a uh, billion dollars a couple of times to upgrade their uh, sewage system. And so that's a, a major cost for them. So water quality is a major driver, particularly nitrogen export from watersheds. Flood hazard, there have been a series of recent downpours that have formed catastrophic flooding uh, in different parts of, of Baltimore. Uh, urban heat island, the lack of vegetation, which you could see in this area, removes evaporative cooling. And in general, all of these, these last two, flood and heat, there's tremendous disparity in outcomes, in other words, inequity. Uh, based on uh, different types of, of neighborhoods. Uh, Reese has developed in places like this. This is a, a forest service lab with intensive measurement uh, capability that's been measuring rainfall, runoff, soil moisture, groundwater for more than 80 years. So much of our knowledge in ecohydrology has really been generated from these types of locations and some of the sites that Naomi has been telling you. However, uh, we developed certain types of principles about how natural ecosystems and watersheds behave. Uh, the natural watersheds tend to maximize carbon sequestration. They tend to minimize flooding. 
they tend to uh, they tend to provide tremendous biodiversity and stability. And so those are ecosystem services we would like to translate into urban areas. So in a place like Coweta or the places where Naomi is working at the hill slope scale, which is why we use hill slopes as a major modeling entity, it's dominated by diffusive processes. So there's a good deal of homogeneity. Naomi showed there's quite a bit of variability at the tree level, but up and down you see similar types of ecosystems with the difference that down here at the base of the slope, you get ecosystems that could take advantage of a more water rich environment because of the receiving waters from upslope. You have more xeric or drought adapted communities up here, even in a wet place like North Carolina. Uh, we're going to ask how do we adapt this type of self organization to a place like Baltimore, where unlike in Naomi's case, they want to thin the forest, we want to reestablish the forest in these places. So here's the questions. Uh, natural ecosystems are self-organizing. Uh, they the spontaneous assembly of different types of species with different water use traits. Uh, and canopy cover, LAI means leaf area index, which you could just take as the density of leaves. Those patterns self-organize and they optimize long-term uh, uh, carbon uptake and water use. In other words, growth ecosystem productivity while minimizing drought stress, trying to buffer drought stress. The important lessons is a covariance of canopy type, species, and density, uh, and water use traits, the ecophysiology of those trees with uh, hill slope position. And it tends to create much more resistant and resilient ecosystem state. So everything that Naomi showed you, we're trying to translate these principles as design guidance for urban restoration and development. And particularly for the benefit of people and environment, recognizing that there is tremendous inequity in uh, ecosystem services and the benefits. Uh, urbanization, just briefly, you vastly increase stormwater. You reduce the amount of evaporation and transpiration of the water used by plants by essentially clearing the plants. You get extensive stream channel erosion, sedimentation, loss of nutrient retention, which is what leads to the decline of the Chesapeake Bay and San Francisco's uh, Bay. Uh, the increased groundwaters also tend to seep into sanitary sewers. We get this type of effect. Uh, Larry, we're not seeing your slide advance. Effect. Sorry. And that uh, is simply pouring. Larry, uh, we're, st we're still suit. seeing slide two. You're still seeing slide two. And I hear you clicking, uh, so I, I think we're not in sync with you. Yeah, so let's see. I just went back to full screen mode. Uh, you're not seeing this at this point, though, I presume. No. Ah. Your, you your screen is. No, it's frozen. Ah, something it's changed. Frozen. OK, now we're seeing a pond, and it says multiple impacts of urbanization. Right, OK, so this is the erosion of streams because of the vastly increased stormwater that takes place. And then because of the loss of evaporation and transpiration, uh, that additional water is recharging groundwater and increasing greater runoff. So if it's recharging groundwater, raising the, the height of the groundwater, this is the result that you get. So there may be too much of a lag to show this type of animation, but you're getting a surcharge of sanitary effluent coming out to the surface. And this is what EPA has been suing Baltimore uh, for. You're seeing a change in slide here? No. I wonder why there's so much of a lag taking place. Uh, so you don't see a slide that says green infrastructure now. Uh, not yet. Uh... I think it was responding a bit better when it was not in presentation mode. Or maybe that's. So I presume I should be able to just choose the PowerPoint uh, to show. Mm -hmm. And that would be in the lower right, I presume, uh, for stop presenting. Mm -hmm. And in my lower right, if I have a present now, that now there are three dots to the. Uh, side to see if there's a uh, full screen. Let's see if that uh, helps. That should be your own view, I think. Yeah, that's but my it, own. That's just my own view. Yeah. But yeah, present, it isn't a present now. And I'm, I'm hitting your entire screen. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying allow me to observe your screen. I'm saying allow. 
can. And um, you should be seeing my screen. Yeah, and your mouse is moving without lag. So, okay, I guess we just, if we stay in this kind of view, it should be good enough. Okay, now can you see the slide that says green yeah. infrastructure up at the top? We can, yes. Okay, all right. We're, we're making progress mm -hmm. in that case. So green infrastructure is essentially a network of vegetated features. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna go back to show you the previous slides, but by removing forest, uh, forest cover, uh, you remove the ability to get evaporative cooling and the evacuation of soil water and groundwater back to the atmosphere. Uh, this is green infrastructure in three different settings. The green infrastructure essentially densifying the vegetation cover, enhancing the canopy, the forest canopy, and putting in a series of features such as this swale drain, roadside swale drain, a standard rain garden, another roadside drainage uh, gain. This is implemented in different ways in different areas. This is a fairly wealthy suburb of Northern Melbourne. And you can see this has actually been designed so that this vertical uh, landscape architecture here, the vertical vegetation blends into the vertical uh, elements in this yard. So the, the homeowners essentially adapted uh, this, uh, this rain garden, this street side swale so that the water comes in, it flows through. You need to have high vegetation with a good deal of leaf area to transpire it back into the atmosphere. This is on the University of Virginia campus. It's institutional. The institutional, the, the institutional controls all land cover in here. This is a part of West Baltimore, which is fairly poor with very ho low uh -huh. home. Now we can see that again. Now you can see that again. You can uh, not so see that page. No, uh, the okay. Baltimore, I think, is what we missed. Uh, okay, Baltimore over here. Uh, so you're seeing my mouse move around? No, I think after a while it must stall out. That must be the, the issue. Yeah, so there's just a tremendous lag taking place. Um, you well, you know what? Three... Uh, the three maps I see it lower, but not uh, updating. So would it be possible for Naomi to present these slides or do you not have them? Do you have them on the Google Doc? I may, let me just check. Let me open up uh, my Google Doc though. I may need to just, uh, uh, where's my Google Doc? Let me just update. This yeah, slide. I've got them. So um, if you, I could. Um... Yeah, let me just. Uh, read this back in because uh... if you want me to share them, I've, I've got them up. Why don't yeah, you do that? It's great. not uh, the most recent, but uh, we don't, we're running out of time for this. All right. How does that look? Can you see my screen? Yep, yeah, I don't perfect. Know if I'm seeing your screen. Uh, or mine. No, it's Naomi. Yeah. So this is perfect. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's updating uh, quickly uh, now. Uh, I think this is where you were, okay, Larry. So, yeah. yeah. So just go back to that last one. So the. Um, the rain garden you see on the last slide did not have the input of local residents who do not have that much uh, influence or power in that area. Because of the lack of communication, after this was put in a very well designed rain garden, residents came out with weed whackers because they were convinced that this would breed mosquitoes and rats and there wasn't sufficient community input for them. This simply states that green infrastructure will be successful with participatory input to the design. So go down to the next one, Naomi. And this next slide uh, simply reiterates what Naomi had shown before. We learn from natural ecosystems. We're based on hill slopes as they're closed, uh, as we have no flux boundaries at the top going into the stream system. 
And a watershed is simply an arrangement of hill slopes. I mean, a, a drainage basin in French is Basin des Versants. Uh, so we're, we're simply simulating the watersheds as families or populations of hill slopes with distributed patches with, within them. We went to the top, Naomi, I know. so go back. I don't know down. why I did that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so we have to fit in all the pipes. Now, the thing is, this is much higher density of information that comes in. Pipe networks, infrastructure, terrain, land cover at very short spatial scales, so meters or at most tens of meters variation. So we use LIDAR, as Naomi was mentioned, very high resolution spectral data, uh, infrastructure data, which is often very incomplete from municipalities, and then human behavior becomes dominant as well. How much do you fertilize your lawn? How do you manage your yard? Uh, what type of trees are you actually selecting for? It's not spontaneous assembly of a biodiversity that we see in a place like Coweta uh, or in Naomi's sites. So the workflow is to pull together this diverse set of information, turn it into parameter files, accomplish a calibration, and then run the simulations becomes uh, fairly intense. So next slide, Naomi. Uh, so this gives an example. You can see the drainage networks that come out of this. This is just the land cover. Uh, but things start to align to a much greater extent with the street, with the built infrastructure. It's much more human dominated and therefore the de human decision making, both at the parcel level, at the individual property, community level and municipality become very strong. And we have to be able to absorb that as, as changes in some of the uh, forcing uh, variables. Next slide. Uh, uh, generally, when we've done this, uh, Naomi mentioned this as well, you have a whole range of different data uh, forms coming in, which could be a mess to try to put together in a reproducible form. So both our groups have put together a series of workflows to automate this, to actually identify where the site is, go out to say something like a USGS stream gauge, outline the watershed from the National Hydrography data set, excribe a rectangle, and then start sampling a series of servers, automating the registration, automating all the GIS functionality, and spinning out eventually the major parameter files uh, with uh, logging of the steps that have actually been taking place so we could look back and re re reproduce this, re reproducible workflows for this. Next slide. And we're coming towards the end. So here's the major question as we move to uh, urban areas with inequity in ecosystem services, how do we balance the function of urban green infrastructure and the provision of what we call urban ecosystem services, stormwater mitigation, urban heat island abatement, uh, 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 carbon sequestration and so forth with individual and community preferences, values, and priorities. In other words, how do we get the direct input of different groups? How can we design resilient, attractive, and functional urban green infrastructure to meet these goals? How, more specifically, how can we incorporate resident direct participation at the design phase, rather than just trying to sell it to the community of parcel and neighborhood green infrastructure? So go back to the go go to the next slide. This is a first dashboard we had put together. Sorry, next slide, Naomi. Uh, with a piece of software from um, uh, NCSA that was called Cyber Integrator. It's now known as Data Wolf, and it essentially embeds a visualization, an ability to add new infrastructure, uh, take away, modify infrastructure, give perspective uh, uh, drawings of it, and then rapidly run. Uh, a new simulation showing the updates at the parcel level, watershed level, or municipal level. The idea is not everybody is going to be able to use this. Certain segments of the population will. Otherwise, it could be used uh, and mediated by an environmental NGO. We've been working with both the city of Baltimore and stormwater utilities in five other cities with this and, and with environmental NGOs to start rolling this out. Go to the next one. Cyber Integrator uh, had its limitations, so we turned to uh, Google, to you guys, uh, to use Google Earth and Google Street View. So in this, um, in this rendition, uh, what we're seeing is uh, the Google platforms uh, 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 
rendition of a high resolution neighborhood in Western in Baltimore County. And then as we uh, let's see if this is going to work now because you're not in present. Can you go into presentation mode, Naomi? Mm -hmm. Let's see if that still works. Yeah, OK. Uh, there are ways you can see on the lower right, we can flip down menus to add different types of trees of different sizes. The trees have different ecophysiology. They have different stomatal functions. So some will be more heavy water users. Some will be less heavy water users. And as you go through, go back to the last, just go up, uh, sorry, uh, right there. You essentially drag and drop different trees in different locations. Working with the landscape architect, sometimes they tell us, put in a photorealistic version of the tree. Sometimes they tell us, just put in a sketch up because you want people to be able to use your imagination and you don't want to overpromise what you're actually going to get. But as Naomi mentioned, we will grow these trees out over time. So we'll increase the size, they'll scale, and you can get a perspective of what you could see at the streetscape level. Google Street View is great for that. It's not great for seeing backyards, but working with shape from uh, 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 shape from shading uh, or different types of uh, high resolution photogrammetry uh, methods, uh, shape, sorry, shape from motion. Uh, we could start capturing other types of perspectives, uh, scenes to start modifying for this. The last thing, go down one more, is once you're done outlining new trees, new types of soils, new types of green infrastructure, uh, you hit one of these buttons, generate Rhesus uh, uh, world file, generate Rhesus flow table, and then that will generate the new parameter files. You then run it in a cloud environment. You're not running this on somebody's desk atop and it spits back what's the change in water footprint, carbon footprint, nitrogen footprint at the parcel. You could see how you're doing relative to your neighbors. Uh, you could see how the stormwater engineer can see what's being accomplished at this watershed or catchment. And at the municipal level, we could see how the entire city is doing as we go through different types of campaigns. So let's go to the next one and wrap up. Uh, so these are next steps in joint interest that Naomi and I have. See, we're both using visualization methods for both science discovery, for public communication, and in this case, for participatory design. We want to do it at a scale that people could actually recognize. Naomi, are you shaking your head? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, yes. Uh, we, we've uh, stated we want to be able to absorb high resolution new, new versions of remote sensing that are coming out from commercial systems with very high repeat cycles, perspective resonant, uh, rendering, also be, to be able to inspect and understand the internal dynamics of the models. Uh, data assimilation, image pattern recognition, urban infrastructure is a good example. It's very poorly captured and represented by a number of cities. Things such as curb uh, curb networks, pipe networks, uh, uh, tree, uh, urban trees, uh, we're actually extracting from high resolution imagery or from perspective imagery from uh, Google Street View. Biodiversity is a question one of you asked before. We actually know what the species distribution is, and we do know it just to an extent. So that's another area that could potentially be used with LIDAR, with other methods to actually recognize what's the biodiversity and the variations in structure. Uh, transition to cloud computing. Obviously, this will run on your laptop in limited cases. Otherwise, you have to parallelize it, put it into large clusters, and it may need to run for a, long, for, uh, a reasonable period. If we're doing it in real time with people as part of participatory work, it's not going to be done on a laptop. It has to go out to a cloud uh, system. Uh, run on those systems and, and report back. We want this to be done in minutes or an hour for a session rather than waiting for a long period of time. So those are areas that we thought might be interesting uh, to Google as well as we're uh, further exploring this technology. I think it's time to quit and I think this was the last slide. So if you had any additional questions for either Naomi or I, sorry for the uh, technical hiccups getting this online. I should know enough to go to Google Docs or Google Presentation when I'm speaking to Google. Mm -hmm. Greg, well, I, I think 
um, will they have access to our emails? Because you, um, you know, feel oh, free to send both of us questions, and we both do work in natural and urban and fire. So, you know, feel free to ask us questions. Absolutely, and please send me your uh, slides. So I'll pu publish the recording and your slides internally, so people can access them afterwards. Well, uh, so, are there absolutely. any questions before we uh, wrap up? Um, I had a, another question. I'm curious. So, obviously. You guys are working together on this. How widely used is this piece of software? Is this like a, a global thing that, that is the de facto standard, or are there other competing frameworks? So this is a there, Go ahead, Naomi. This is a more limited I was gonna space. Say, it's not um, like global modeling. Yeah, it's it's you know it's it's not as well shared as say some of the NCAR products, but um, we do have a pretty big user community and. Some of our users are in Europe, some of them are in Australia. I mean, we, we um, you know, and we, every once in a while get together, we try to maintain a certain amount of user support um, through our GitHub site and our wiki. Um, things tend to kind of devolve a little and every once in a while we have to bring them back together, but it is used by multiple labs. It's certainly not just Larry and I who are using this. Uh, I was curious in terms of uh, data or computation algorithms, um, are there any places where you see uh, additional help uh, being a game changer for you? Oh yeah, I mean, any anything that would help, um, you know, speeding up this data assimilation, particularly high resolution remote sensing, both things like LiDAR, but also multi-spectral data we've been using in, in Santa Barbara to do some of the urban stuff. I, I think that would really help, um, you know, anything that increases the speed so we can run more sensitivity analysis would help. Any way to deal with, we generate so much volumes of output. So ways to deal better deal with our output um, efficiently. I mean, we have ideas, but we also, you know, we're academics. We, we don't have sometimes the programming staff that we would like to do kind of input output really is the place where we need the most help. Yeah. I mean, the main difference is of course, we're, uh, at, this is an academic, uh, uh, product that's being used increasingly for application, but we don't have an agency behind us. You know, we don't have NCAR or USDA or NASA. Uh, that's made this a, their official model. We have, I, I, Naomi, I'm going to guess uh, a few tens of users uh, globally or so. Uh, yeah, and probably then up a to smaller it. number of core yep. users. Uh, high resolution, dense LIDAR point clouds is something we've been working with to extract structure in urban areas. Uh, and then to pull, use that along with uh, uh, shape from motion uh, to pull together uh, the type of 3D. Uh, scenes that we're actually working with. Uh, there's a number of other areas. Uh, the subsurface is poorly documented. Soils and ground and uh, and aquifers. Naomi mentioned she's working with some geophysicists to try to extract subsurface uh, structure. Uh, but whereas we could remotely sense uh, what's sitting on the surface, what lies beneath is still is still uh, you know probably the most uncertain. We've used different types of inference engines to infer the types of soils, uh, but that's another area where um, using different types of pattern recognition, inference engines and AI could certainly help. I would add one more thing to that list. Um, certainly, like I said, multi-spectral data. We've been using a lot that a lot for our urban stuff here, but then always, um, as I said, you know, high resolution climate data, um, Precip in particular, it, you know, there are places where you have radar data, but you know, many places where that doesn't work for all kinds of reasons. So improving our our climate inputs still also is a big area. The last thing I'll say is biodiversity. We don't remote sense we don't we don't remote sense remote sense species. We could Yes, we do, Larry. Broadly. That's what the multispectral does. <laughs> right, but that's just at the outset now. Yes, You're yes, we've been doing a little bit with that. Great, rather than saying, ah, that's a red maple, or that's a white oak rather than a red oak. Uh, Fair enough. But uh, the different types of species, particularly between different types of water use traits, what's called isohydricity, uh, yes. is not directly remotely sensed, but the traits could be 
sensed. And some of the high resolution multispectral uh, methods plus, uh, you know, going out into the thermal area as well and fluorescence may be useful for that type of work. Just to add one thing to that, it's, it's not enough that, okay, we find the remote sensing product that gives us, say, our, our species assemblages. It's also the work to, trans, to, imp, to assimilate that into the model, accounting for all of the various uncertainties and, you know, involved in doing that, right? So it's not just the data, but how do you, how do you link that data effectively and efficiently with the model is a big challenge. Well, that makes sense. Well, well, thank you very much. There's a lot of uh, food for thought about like how Google might be able to contribute. Yeah, we look forward to hearing from you. It would be great. Okay. So well, thanks. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks, Greg. Good to talk to all of you. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.